So, welcome. Uh, welcome to the concourse session on semantics. And uh, the, first, the first presentation, the first paper uh, presented here is by Michele Borleale and Daniele Gorla on algebra and coalgebra of stream products. So can you please, can you please show the, uh, uh, the presentation? So uh, Daniele is supposed to be the speaker. Um, yeah, here we have it. In this video, I will present the technical content of the paper Algebra and Coalgebra of Stream Products, written by Michele Boreale and myself. We assume a finite non-empty set of variables x1, xn, and a distinct variable x that is the independent variable, whereas x1, xn are dependent variables uh, that is uh, marker places for functions in x, and they are defined by differential equations and initial values. Differential equations associate to every x1, xn, a derivative, that it is a polynomial, pi, with coefficients in k, a generic field of characteristic 0, and indeterminates in x, x1, xn. By contrast, an initial condition is simply a n-tuple of elements of the generic field. This way of defining polynomial functions recalls the way in which streams are usually defined. Streams over k are infinite sequences of elements from k, the generic field. Sigma can be naturally given a stream coalgebra structure by providing it with the notion of derivative and output, where the output of a stream is its first element, and the derivative of a stream is the remaining elements from the second one on. In general, a stream coalgebra with outputs in K can be seen as an automaton with a non-empty set of states, a transition function that it is the derivative and an output function that associates to every state an uh, element of the field. So now, given two coalgebras C1 and C2, a coalgebra morphism between them is a function between their states, mu, such that mu of the derivative of S is the, the derivative of mu of S, and the output of S coincides with the output of mu s. Rutten proved that sigma is the final coalgebra with outputs in k, and so for every coalgebra c in this class, there exists a unique coalgebra morphism mu from c to sigma. Also, polynomials can be given a coalgebraic structure, and indeed our first main result is that once fixed an initial value problem, the corresponding final morphism into sigma is also a k-algebra homomorphism from polynomials to strings. In this way, mu reflects both the algebraic and the coalgebraic properties of polynomials because it is both a coalgebra morphism and a k-algebra homomorphism. To make polynomials a coalgebra, we need to define the output and the transition, so the derivative. The output is straightforward and only depends on the initial uh, conditions uh, rho in the initial value problem. Indeed, it's enough to replace every dependent variable with its initial value and then make the calculations into the field k. 
By contrast, the definition of the derivative is not trivial and depends on the product adopt, uh, adopted for streams, and there are many such products. Indeed, Rutten, in his uh, 2019 uh, paper, enumerates uh, uh, four products for streams. The convolution product, the shuffle product, the Adamart product, and the infiltration product. Notice that all these products have a clear counterpart in the semantics of programming languages, mostly in concurrency, because convolution corresponds to sequential composition, shuffle corresponds to interleaving, Adamard corresponds to synchronization, and the infiltration product corresponds to the fully synchronized interleaving. Convolution, shuffle, and infiltration have uh, one followed by all zeros as identity, whereas Adamard has all ones as, uh, uh, as the identity. Let's consider a generic stream product pi together with its identity 1 pi. And we shall only consider products whose derivative is given by a polynomial function at least in the uh, multiplied streams. Actually, to be more precise, we shall consider a polynomial f with coefficients in the field k and indeterminates x, the independent variable, y1, y2, y3, and y4, corresponding to the multiplied streams and their derivatives, and another polynomial g, always with the coefficients in k and indeterminate y1 corresponding to the identity 1 pi. We then say that uh, pi is an fg product if for every stream sigma and tau we have that the output of uh, the multiplication between sigma and tau is the product between uh, the output of sigma and the output of tau and the derivative of the multiplication between sigma and tau is f calculated on the independent variable, sigma, its derivative, tau, and its derivative. Then the output of 1 pi must be 1, and the derivative of 1 pi must be g of 1 pi. We notice that all the products shown in the previous slide are fg products. These are the f's for convolution, shuffle, adamant, and infiltration. The g for convolution, shuffle, and infiltration are the zero polynomial, whereas the g for the adamant is the identity on y1. We then require that the derivative for polynomials mimics the polynomials f and g defined for the uh, considered stream product. So given an initial value problem and an fg product pi on streams, we define the derivative for polynomials associated to the product pi by first defining it inductively on monomials and then by extending it to polynomials by linearity. So in particular, the derivative of one is g of one the derivative of a single variable xi is the derivative of xi as specified in the initial value problem. Then to define the derivative of a larger monomial, we assume a total ordering on the variables and we first calculate the derivative on the, uh, on the minimal uh, variable with respect to such an ordering. So the derivative of xy m, where xy is the minimum variable in the monomial xi m, is f calculated on the independent variable on the xi, on the derivative of xi, and on the remaining m and its derivative. Then, since a polynomial is a linear combination of monomials, the derivative of a polynomial will be the linear combination of the derivative of the monomials. We are almost ready for our full abstraction result. 
Notationally, we write f pi p q for f of x p pi derivative of p q pi derivative of q. To obtain our theorem, we have to require that the uh, product pi satisfies the following uh, uh, constraints. That should be evident uh, once you think f pi p q to be the derivative of the polynomial product between p and q. The uh, requirements that we impose for a product pi to be well behaved are the following f pi of 1q is the pi derivative of q. f pi of xi m1 and m2 equals f pi of m1 and xi m2. f pi of a linear combination of monomials and q is the linear combination of the f pi between the monomials and q. And finally, f pi is commutative. So our main theorem states that uh, if we have a well-behaved fg product pi, then the unique coalgebra morphism mu pi from polynomials with derivatives delta pi to streams is also a k-algebra homomorphism from polynomials with the usual notions of sums and product to streams with the usual no notion of sum and product pi. Conversely, if we have a k-algebra homomorphism nu from polynomials to streams that respects the given initial value problem, then nu is also a coalgebra morphism from polynomials to streams. But since we know that streams is the final coalgebra, this nu can only be mu pi, and this provides the full abstraction result. Polynomial syntax allows us to use algebraic geometric techniques to prove stream equalities. And indeed, in particular, we shall now give an algorithm for checking whether two polynomials are semantically equivalent in the sense that they are mapped to the same stream by mu pi. Since mu pi is linear, we have that this is equivalent to showing that mu pi maps their difference to zero. For doing this, uh, we have to recall some notion about uh, uh, ideals. An ideal is a set of polynomials that contains the zero, that it is closed by sums, and it is closed by products with an arbitrary polynomial. So given a set of polynomial S, the ideal generated by S is obtained by summing all the possible products between an element of S and a generic polynomial. By the Hilbert basis theorem, any infinite ascending chain of ideals, I0 contained in I1, contained in I2, and so on, stabilizes in a finite number, number of steps, in the sense that uh, there exists a K such that for every J, the ideal k plus j equals the ideal k. So, to prove that uh, p is mapped into 0 by mu pi, we have to prove that the output of every derivative of p is 0. But, of course, this is not uh, an effective procedure because we have infinitely many derivatives. But due to the stabilization property of ideals, at some point, the j derivative of p will belong to the ideal generated by the first j derivatives, so from p itself to the derivative j minus 1. So this implies that we can stop checking that the output of the derivatives is 0. So the algorithm is very simple. It takes a polynomial and a well-behaved fg product pi, and for all derivatives of the polynomial p, it checks. If the output of the derivative is not zero, then returns no. Otherwise, it checks whether the derivative belongs to the ideal of the previous k derivatives, and in that case, stops and returns yes. To prove correct 
correctness of this algorithm, that it is our second main result of the paper, we need an additional mild condition on f, and we require that f belongs to the ideal generated by the variables uh, y3 and y4. All the polynomials f for all stream products uh, considered in our paper satisfy this condition, and so we can prove the theorem that for a given well-behaved fg product, with f belonging to the ideal generated by y3 and y4, the algorithm terminates and returns yes if and only if mu pi of p is equal to zero. To give you an idea on how our algorithm works, let's consider the following simple linear example. So we have the initial value problem defined by the following differential equations and initial values. You can easily check that under the convolution product, x1 defines the Fibonacci numbers in the sense that mu convolution of x1 is the stream made up by the Fibonacci numbers. We want to prove that the polynomials x and x1 times 1 minus x minus x squared are semantically equivalent under mu convolution or equivalently by using our algorithm that mu convolution maps to zero the polynomial p defined as uh, x1 that multiplies y minus x minus x squared all minus x. The algorithm actually performs uh, three executions uh, of the four because when considering the second derivative of p it realizes that uh, it belongs to the ideal generated by p and its first derivative. Moreover, since both p, its first derivative and its second derivative have output zero, it concludes that mu convolution of p is zero. In the paper, we also have a nonlinear example that I invite you to read if you're curious. It is known that the generating function associated to Fibonacci numbers is uh, z over 1 minus z minus z square. Now, since the convolution product admits an inverse of a given stream whenever the output of the stream is not zero, from what we have proved with our algorithm in the previous slide, we have that by singling out mu convolution of x1, this is equal to mu convolution of x over 1 minus mu convolution x minus mu convolution x square. And the structural identity of these two expressions is not coincidence. Algebraic identities on streams indeed exactly correspond to algebraic identities on generating functions. And in the paper we formally prove this connection for convolution and the ordinary generating function. And then also for shuffle and the exponential generating function. Moreover, we also show how shuffle is related to the solution of uh, ordinary differential equations, and in the full paper, available at Archive, you can also find some interconnections between uh, linear ordinary differential equations and the Laplace transform. So, to conclude, uh, we have studied connections uh, between polynomials, differential equations, and streams, from an algebraic and co-algebraic perspective. Our main result is a full abstraction result showing that uh, given any steam product that satisfies uh, certain very reasonable assumptions, there is a canonical way to define uh, a derivative on polynomials such that the induced unique co-algebra morphism into streams is also a k-algebra homomorphism and vice versa. We have used this uh, full abstraction result for developing a decision algorithm for polynomial stream equivalence and for reasoning on generating functions and ordinary differential equations. As a future work, it will be interesting to define new notions of products for streams that respect our format and to formally compare our results with the result obtained in B algebras. Actually, the algebras are very abstract formalisms and require a substantial 
background in category theory. We don't have any such background required for understanding our work that it is as elementary and as accessible as possible. Furthermore, the algebras as well as term algebras don't have the power given by the algebra of polynomials where the additional structure arising from monomials is essential. Indeed, on the well ordering on monomials, we can exploit the Hilbert basis theorem that it is uh, crucial for our algorithm. No such result can be used in term algebras or B algebras. Another closely related work is Jost Winter's PhD thesis, where he studies coalgebra and polynomial systems, and it proves that under suitable assumptions, his system of equations is isomorphic to certain context-free grammars. However, he works in a setting where polynomials rely on non-commuting variables, and again, these sets wins treatment in a totally different mathematical framework where the algebraic geometric, geometric concepts that we have used in our algorithm cannot be used at all. So, enjoy reading our paper and thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Daniele, for the nice video. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I suppose the preferred way is to ask them through uh, your chat or, or the Q&A mechanism of Zoom. And so if, if anybody has any questions, please ask them, please ask them now. Uh, I have a couple <laughs> while we wait for other questions. So yeah, so I, I, I think the, the, the connection to bialgebras should really be developed. So so whenever whenever you say that a final morphism is an algebra morphism, you immediately suspect that there's there must be some distributive law lurking behind behind that. And I suppose you you haven't really tried very hard to uh, to identify what the distributive law would be or e what even would be the base category of it. it would it be sets or something else? No, you you haven't. No, we we really didn't uh, try to to look at this from a categorical theory perspective. So this is definitely something that we have we are uh, planning to do in the full paper and uh, it is on on the on the table but still not developed yes I, the, definitely the, the 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 equations that you have on your slide as a well what, what it means for a product to be well behaved mm -hmm. that i think should I, I i haven't looked at it well I, I, but I, it should be a hint on on what what kind of category what what category you live in yeah and, and, uh, is that it's the, 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 these kind of equations is not something that appears in the definition of a distributive law. So naturality, naturality probably corresponds more to your just definition of an empty product. Uh, Well-behavedness, I think the, these equations are more interesting. I also have another question. Yeah. Uh, so the notion of, I, I forgot what you call it, the notion, the, 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 what you call a mild condition that makes the algorithm work. The, the dependence only on x3 and x4. Mm -hmm. uh, can you Im can you invent for what what would be the kind of product for which this fails, and what what goes wrong with the algorithm uh, in 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 that case? Does it not terminate or uh, uh, it, it must terminate anyway? Yeah. So so what what kind of ro what's wrong <laughs> if if this condition doesn't hold? Uh, <clears throat> well, to be honest, I have to check again the proof. I don't, I don't remember where this comes into the play. And it's not about termination. It's about uh, correctness. I don't remember which uh, direction uh, needs uh, this, uh, this, uh, this requirement. Michele, do you maybe remember which of the two directions? The yes. Um, no? um, Hello. Uh, so I don't I don't remember the uh, I can't recall the precise details right now, but uh, in fact it has to do with termination. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh. In the sense that uh, this is a, syn a syntactic condition, okay, on polynomials uh, that ensures 
well, on the derivatives of polynomial, that ensures essentially that, uh, uh, that at some point, um, yes, that at some point the, the, the derivative that you uh, generate, so there is a derivative which belongs to the ideal generated by the previous uh, uh, derivative, so to speak. So this is, this is the, the, the essentially the, the, the essential point, okay? This, this is a syntactic condition which ensures essentially that uh, if you consider um, the chain of ideas generated by the successive uh, derivatives, uh, polynomial derivatives, I mean, uh, eventually uh, this chain uh, gets stable, so to speak. Uh, but I mean, th uh, this is really a technical condition. I don't know, in fact, if it is re really necessary or not, in the sense that uh, <laughs> we, uh, I mean, we manage. Oh, it, is, it is necessary. It is necessary for the yes part of the, the yes part. So okay. If it returns yes, then this means that the, the derivative, the, the, the mu is zero. This well, is I'm, asking, the, I'm asking this question because you, you, you tell you said that it's a quite a technical condition, <laughs> but this kind of conditions is not it's, it is not unheard of in the, in the bi-algebraic setting. Mm -hmm. The dependence only on successive variables is a sort of lack of loops in the reasoning. That's that's not uh, it's not completely unnatural. This kind of condition. So it's not. Uh, I, I'm not saying it's 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 a crazy condition. It's a, it's it might make some sense from the abstract perspective. Yeah, yeah. This is something that we should definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, investigate. Um, so thank you for this for this uh, this suggestion. All right. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry. I, I talked a lot, but nobody's. So he seems to be asking any questions uh, apart from myself. So we don't, we don't have so much time. So, so uh, uh, thanks, Daniela and Michele. Let's stay in touch about this, okay? <laughs> uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, please. And, and we, should, we should move to the, uh, to the second talk, which I believe uh, will be given by, by Simon Foster. Did you record the video, Simon? Yeah, yes, okay. I did. So uh, uh, the next paper, uh, uh, is 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 about uh, formally verified simulations of state-rich processes using interaction trees in Isabel Hall, and uh, the paper was written by Simon Foster, Chung Kilhur, and Jean Woodock. Please uh, uh, show us the video. Excuse me, can we perhaps start again with the sound on? Because we cannot hear anything of, of the video. Hello, we need help. Yes. We haven't heard any sound. Can, 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 okay. can, we, can we please restart with the sound on? Still nothing, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, there's still, there's still no sound for us. Just a minute. U Uwe suggested there is a checkbox when sharing screen to turn the sound on.
Um, I unfortunately I'm not quite set up to to give the talk live. I gave a, a, a demo and I'm not not set okay. up for that. So there's, yeah, a, okay. there's a video. <laughs> So, well, we seem to have uh, technical problems here. I mean, if, if it's an issue, could we um, change the order and I can... I think, I think that's what we're, that's what we're about. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try in the meantime to see if I can... Maybe I can play the video myself. Okay, let's... let's, uh, let's uh, I, I, yeah, so I'm making this decision right now. So let's... The last... Let's move to the, uh, to the last track of this session, which is, well, we, we were supposed to present it earlier, but we had technical problems. Uh, uh, Simon, are you prepared to share your video? And uh, yeah. the question is, are you allowed to share your video in our session? Uh, it said host disabled participant screen sharing. So can we, ha can we, uh, can we ask the host to allow uh, at least Simon to, 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 share, uh, to share his video and let's perhaps try to, uh, to do that? Okay, that should uh, hopefully work. Great. Okay, let's try this then. Let's hope. Well, hello everyone. My name is Simon Foster. I'm from the University of York. I'm going to be presenting um, our paper, Formally Verified. Again. Well, hello everyone. My name is Simon Foster. I'm from the University of York. I'm going to be presenting um, our paper, Formally Verified Simulations of State-Rich Processes Using Interaction Trees in Isabel Hall. Uh, this is joint work with Professor John Hoare from Seoul National University and Professor Jim Woodcock from York University as well. So interaction trees are co-inductive structures with okay, I'm going potentially to infinite else. breadth and depth which are used to represent the way a process communicates with its Simon, uh, it was working. It was. Could you hear it? It was okay before you stopped it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. I should have said that. I'm sorry. I didn't realize because I couldn't hear anything. So I assumed oh, that it we wasn't. Could. We could. It's a sort of a dual to the, to the previous problem. Okay. Okay, fine. Then let me, sorry, I'll, I'll start it again. Let's start again and it should be okay. Okay. Okay, great. Uh... Well, hello, everyone. My name is Simon Foster. I'm from the University of York. I'm going to be presenting um, our paper, Formally Verified Simulations of State-Rich Processes Using Interaction Trees in Isabel Hall. Uh, this is joint work with Professor Chungil He from Seoul National University and Professor Jim Woodcock from York University as well. So interaction trees are co-inductive structures with potentially infinite breadth and depth, which are used to represent the way a process communicates with its environment and evolves over time. Uh, they're used to give formal semantics to programming languages, and here we're going to be showing how we can develop verification and simulation support in Isabel for them. We can use interaction trees to encode symbolic label transition systems for a variety of process algebraic languages, and crucially, interaction trees are executable. Um, and that means that they are applicable to the production of verified simulations and implementations. Now, interaction trees were previously mechanized in COC and have been applied in several program verification projects. The contributions of this paper are a novel mechanization of interaction trees in Isabel Hall. Uh, this requires some quite substantial adaptation of the COC implementation. We provide an iTree based semantics for deterministic CSP and circus processes. Uh, this includes a formal link with the standard failures divergences semantic model. And we provide a method for generating animations using the Isabel code generator. 
So first I'm gonna explain how, what an interaction tree is. So um, we describe an interaction tree using a co-data type. So this is um, a kind of way of representing co-inductive structures in Isabel. Uh, we fix two, two types for events and for return values. And then we define an interaction tree um, using three constructors. So the first is a return, meaning that we terminate returning a value in R. We can do an invisible silent event, right? So SIL, and then we behave as a, um, a success interaction tree. And finally, we have visible events, right? And here we have a partial function. Um, so it's this, this arrow here means a partial function from events to interaction trees. And so the idea is that every event um, can have a maximum of one continuation that may follow it. So this is kind of like a menu of possibilities. Right? So these are the enabled events and then the interaction trees that occur after this event is chosen, should it be chosen. We introduce some um, <coughs> notation for interaction trees and um, tick V for returning a value V, tau P for the silent events, and this kind of um, notation for a choice. So what this means is that we pick some E in a set of events E, and then we behave as P of E, right? Um, which is represented by this. So th this is a partial function here, right? Partial lambda abstraction where the domain is E. So here are some examples of finite interaction trees. So um, this interaction tree performs three tau events and then terminates returning the value five. Um, this is a deadlocked um, interaction tree. So this, this is an interaction tree with a visible event, but the visible event function here is, is empty, right? So it's an empty partial function. That's how we represent that. So no events are enabled and therefore we are deadlocked. Um, and finally, this is a kind of process algebraic um, interaction tree. So we've got two choices. We can either do an event A, and at that point we behave, uh, we perform a silent event and then return um, uh, the value X, or alternatively, we can do the B event and then we deadlock. Right? And all of these things can be represented using interaction trees. Um, of course, since these are co-inductive structures, they can also be infinite. Um, and we can construct infinite depth interaction trees using primitive co-recursion. So this is an example of a primitive co-recursive definition. Um, we give it a type, it's an interaction tree, a prim co-rec, where we have this equation here. So div equals tau of div. Um, now, of course, if this was a recursive definition, this wouldn't be valid because it doesn't terminate. But because we're in the world of co data, we can have infinite things very easily. One thing we require, though, is that such definitions are productive. So that means that all equations in a prim co rec must guard the co recursive call with a constructor, a constructor. So, for instance, in this case, div is guarded by tau. And that means that we can always unfold it one step, right? So even though it's infinite, we can step through it, which may, means that we can compute with it. And we can relate infinite I trees by constructing by simulation relations and weak by simulation relations. Uh, the details are in the paper. So now I'm going to explain how we use I trees to give us semantics to CSP. So CSP, um, I guess it's a language we're all familiar with. So you have channels, um, you have processors. Um, communicating with each other using these channels. Um, and so you can input values, which is what, what this represents here. We can output values and inputs and outputs match up with each other. And we have parallel composition. We have external choice. So we can have sequential processes that make choices between different events and, and so on and so forth. All right. So here's a simple example of a CSP process. It's a buffer, very simple example. It's a parametric process where the um, the parameter buff represents the current state of the buffer. So it's, it's a list of integers in this case. Um, and, and then the, the body is, is, is a choice, right? So we can either input a value X over the input channel and then behave as buffer where we've added that input value onto the end of the, the state. Or if the length of the buffer is greater than zero, then we can output the head and then remove the head from the buffer and, and recursively continue in that way. So in this paper, we're going to allow us to characterize the semantics of such processes, um, but we focus on processes that are deterministic. Um, so this is an example of a deterministic process, right? So 
And when you have this choice here, you can either choose an input or an output, right? So the same event can't occur on either side. Whereas a process like this, A then P, choice A then Q is excluded because A can either go to P or Q, and so we're not going to allow that. Uh, we encode variants of all the operators above um, that enforce determinism. We can't show all of them because there's not enough time, but they're all in the paper. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview of some of the operators that we've encoded and how that's done. So we're going to think about basic processes communicating over channels. And in our Isabel mechanization, we model channels using prisms. Um, if you don't know prisms, they're a well-known concept from functional programming. Essentially, prisms give us an abstract way of characterizing the constructors of an algebraic data type. So an algebraic data type has several constructors associated with it, which can carry parameters. And prisms allow us to characterize each of these parameters. So a prism, C, um, so v, uh, we have this kind of funny arrow notation um, uh, because, because we're talking about prisms, so that's why the, the triangle means. Uh, v is going to be the value of data that this channel carries, and E is going to be the, the type of events, right? And we characterize prisms using two functions, a build function that allows us to build an event over a channel, and a match function that allows us to destruct an event. Um, from a particular channel. Of course, the latter is partial because we may have several possible channels, and so we have to know um, that we're applying match to a, an event of the correct kind. Um, now, once we've got these, we can now um, begin to construct some um, interaction trees um, for CSP processes. So here is an interaction tree um, uh, constructor for an output event. So it takes a channel of type V in the event set E, a value which we're going to send over that channel, and it produces an interaction tree. And this has got an empty return associated with it. And that's because there's no value that we're returning, right? Because we're doing an output. Um, and so the way that we represent this is that we have a singleton visible event, right? So we just have this single maplet here. So we're going to allow the event um, C um, carrying the value V. And then after that, we're going to um, behave as ret empty, which basically means we terminate. So, so what does this mean? So, so we, um, we output our event and then we terminate and then we can potentially move on to do something else. An input event is a little bit more involved than this, but it's, it's basically the same concept. So again, we have a channel. Um, we're going to allow us to restrict the domain of, 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 of values that we're going to allow to receive. And in this case, we're not going to produce an empty value. We're actually going to produce the value that we input, right? So this can then be passed on to a successor. And so the way this is represented is as a partial function whose domain is going to be the domain of the match function. So we're only going to accept inputs over this channel, which is what that means. Um, and we're also going to restrict ourselves to this set A. And so we accept an event over this channel and then we destruct that channel using match and we return the value, right? So you input a value and then you return it. Right? And then that can be used by a successor. So of course, this assumes that we can then sequentially compose things together. And the way that we can sequentially compose things is by using a monad. Um, so we've defined a, a, a monadic bind operator, P then Q. So P here is an interaction tree and K is what we call a Kleisley tree. So it's a function from a value to an interaction tree. And so the idea is that P executes until it returns a value and then it passes that value on to K. Um, it's defined as a primitive co-recursive definition. I won't go through it in detail because I don't have time, but it, essentially the idea is that um, tau events, you're just gonna kind of, kind of skip over those, right? You're just gonna kind of push them out to the front. Visible events, the same, but when you come to a return value, you're gonna pass that return value onto the continuation K. Now, if P, so the first argument of the bind doesn't return, doesn't terminate, then, um, then P bind K is going to be equal to P. So, for instance, if P is stop or div, um, then, then that's a left zero for, for bind, right? Now, using this operator, we can now define um, the actual core um, output and uh, input events by using a bind. So, uh, for instance, this one, when we we first of all output uh, a value over C and then we behave as B. So how do we do this? Well, we, we first of all do the output and then we bind that to the function um, which behaves as P. And, and, and similarly for the input. So we input the value and then we pass it on to P, the, the continuation. 
Now, as I said, we've encoded all the operators of CSP in this one, but I can't go through them. But what I'd like to just summarize very briefly is then how we link this kind of semantics to the standard failures divergences model um, of CSP. So what we do um, essentially first is we, we characterize a big step operational semantics. So we have a transition relation that says that P um, can evolve to become P primed over some sequence of events TR, which is what you've got here. And we have these production rules. And so, so we encode an inductive relation, which gives a characterization of um, operational big step operational semantics for any interaction tree. We then can characterize um, um, Bill Roscoe's um, transition relation, which he defines in his book, Understanding Concurrent Systems. I can't go into detail again, it's all in the paper. But then from that, we can describe all the um, parts of the failures divergences model. So we can define the set of traces of an interaction tree. We can design, um, define the set of failures. So these are the partial traces where you arrive at a state where you're willing to accept a certain number of values, and we can define the divergences. So, so these are the traces that lead to infinite tau behavior, right? And we've shown that um, this, th these um, characterizations satisfy many of the important properties of the failures divergences model. So I want to conclude my talk by talking about formally verified simulations. So Isabel's code generator allows the production of code from Isabel definitions in Haskell, Scala, and SML. And um, so way, the way this works is you can define uh, a function or a, a co-recursive definition in Isabel, and then the code generator will produce code in the target language, in, in this case, Haskell. Right? So this is the append function, of course, and the equivalent in, in Haskell. So these definitions can depend on library functions, but this requires trust. So the, the code generator is very principled, so it will ge code generate for everything potentially, every definition you make, or you can say, well, I'm gonna trust this function and so I'm gonna make use of it. And, and that means that you get more efficiency, of course, at the expense potentially of trust. So what we do in our work is we allow animation by code generation. And, and this is a really nice feature of interaction trees. So essentially what we do is we construct, first of all, construct an iTree based um, CSP process in Isabel. And then we use the, the code generator to generate equivalent Haskell code for that. And we can do that because Haskell is lazy evalu has lazy evaluation and so it can represent infinite structures um, very naturally. We need to employ data refinement to provide an executable implementation of partial functions. Again, the details are in the paper, and that's just because things like calculating the domain of a partial function isn't always decidable. And so we have to come up with a, with a kind of restricted subset of partial functions, which is decidable. And we then leverage lazy evaluation to allow stepping through interaction trees. So what I'm gonna do now just briefly is to give an example of how this works. Okay, so here we are in the Isabel environment now. Um, so we've got a theory, Isabel theory called buffer underscore CSP, which is gonna be the buffer example that we looked at earlier. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we first of all define a type for all the channels that we have. Um, so we have, um, we can input an integer, um, which is gonna go into the buffer. We can output one, which can be taken out of the buffer. And in, in addition, we can also query the state, right? And this is gonna be useful during animation just so that we can see uh, what values are in the in the list. Um, we represent this in a slightly different notation to what we saw earlier, although we can support exactly the same notation. It's just just, e just slightly easier um, to show it de-sugared at this point. Um, so we have a loop, right? So we have a kind of looping thing. So we're defining it as a um, uh, tail recursive definition. Um, and then we have all the possibilities that can occur, right? So here um, we can input over the in channel and we return um, the, the updated buffer as, as before. Um, or alternatively, we have this kind of guarded definition where we say that if the length of the buffer is greater than zero, then we're going to output the value that's at the head and return the tail. Um, or thirdly, we're going to allow to query the state, right? So we can look at the current value of S, right? Um, and, and then we, we, we don't change the state otherwise. So this is the definition of our, of our buffer. So now what I can do is we'll have this command that we've developed called simulate. And so when you go to it, it um, so what happens in the background is it generates code right, for all of this in Haskell, and it then um, inserts the, the animator into that code, right? And then if I click start simulation, so GHCI loads up at the bottom with the simulator. And then what I can do is 
I can do simulate, oops, I can do simulate buffer. Um, so so uh, there's a technical thing here, which is we're having to restrict how many values, we, the, the, the kind of set of values that we're going to allow. And that's just to make the, the animation um, displayable, right? So you can display all of the possibilities, because of course, if you have an infinite number of possible values, you wouldn't be able to display it. So, so we give that set, which in this case is 0, 1, 2, and 3, and we give the initial value of the buffer empty, and we run the simulator like this. And now we can see where we can actually simulate this interaction tree, right? So it gives us all the options there at the bottom. Um, so I'm going to input a value into the buffer by selecting number two. I'll put in another one, and put one in, and then I put, uh, let, let's put a three in. And, and you can see that the, the buffer is being updated, right? So you can see the state there is, is changing. Um, but then I can start to output things. So I output, one, output zero, and it goes down to one, three. And then I output one and so on. And then the buffer's empty and we're back to where we started again. Right. So this shows then how we can um, go right from this iTree based representation into something that can be simulated and potentially something that we can use in an implementation, right? Not necessarily a very efficient implementation, but a correct implementation nevertheless, which is quite useful. Okay, so I'm going to conclude now. So we've adapted the cock mechanization of interaction trees to Isabel Hull. Uh, we use them to give us semantics to CSP and Circus as well. Uh, we didn't show the implementation of Circus in our space, but um, uh, so Circus is like CSP, except it has state variables. And so we can also represent those, which is, is quite nice. Um, we applied the code generator to the production of animations. And I hope you can see that this process is, is pretty much automated, right? All that you have to do is feed in a process definition and then the animation just pops out using the code generator. And that's very nice, right? So there's lots of applications I think that we can apply this to. So where you want to take a formal model and simulate it, right? Often we can only verify it, but simulation is a really useful technique that people can use to understand the formal model and to find corner cases and so on. So things that we're going to be applying this to in the future is we've got this language RoboChart that's developed at York, which is a modeling language for robotic controllers. And at the moment, we're developing a, a semantics based on CSP um, on, on top of this interaction tree um, animator, which means we can then um, animate robotic controllers and potentially insert them into kind of 3D simulations of them in the future, which would be very nice. Um, in order to make this work, we'll need to consider more efficient uh, implementations of partial functions. At the moment, we're using associative lists, but there are better um, implementations out there. And we also need to consider non-determinism, um, which we have various, various ways that we can think about that. There's more information in the paper. Um, and also, we'll need to think about real time in the future. So thank you for listening. Here are some useful um, uh, citations and um, the code is all available on github at the bottom there and uh, thank you for listening uh, goodbye um, thanks simon for the presentation and thanks for uh, well, giving it so quickly uh, from your own machine uh, uh, in spite of technical problems uh, it, I, I don't see any questions in the chat right now if, if anybody has has questions uh, please ask them now so, so I, I wanted to ask i, I wonder uh, about the non-determinism. Mm -hmm. So, what is the main obstacle there? Because I suppose I, I, I'm not I, I'm not going to pretend that I understand everything you do. But at the very end, when you generalize, when you generate Haskell code, you would expect that yeah, you just slap the list monad on top of everything and you get non-deterministic uh, programs. But what happens in the middle? What's the main What's the main uh, obstacle in the in the in the in the theory there? Uh, I'd like to understand. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the obstacle to that is uh, comes down to the fact that your visible event choices are, are functions, right, um, in, in the interaction trees, right? So each each event you, goes to only one possibility. Um, th th there's a sense in which that, you know, so when we resolve non-determinism in an animator, we always have to give a give a nevertheless give away to whoever's animating it to resolve that non-determinism right so th th there's a sense in which the interaction trees is only representing what's actually true in reality that somehow there has to be a menu of options even if there's non-determinism they will be distinguished in some way so for instance in the list monad of course they'll have a different position in that list right um and and so you can still you, you can still distinguish them um the, the real obstacle is is more to do with how do you manifest that to the user then right so you know like if we if we put uh, if we change from a function to a relation or something like that you know which is possible um 
of, of course you you'd still end up with the same problem right at, at the animation level you have to ultimately turn that set into something that can be executed right so um so at the moment it, yeah it's still a question as to as to what's the right way of doing that but but yeah there's, there's lots of different ways of doing it i mean you can kind of represent non-determinism now because you can always just say i don't know i don't know what to do at this point i'm just going to give the uh, you know give the choice to whoever's animating this and, and that's one way of doing it um but but yeah um if that answers your question yeah yeah it, it does to some extent yes thanks uh it's quite interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, are there any other questions i don't see any okay uh thanks Simon, and thanks for for all the speakers my apologies for the technical uh, delay uh, to this session due to technical problems uh thanks to all the speakers in this session and well let's let's have a break i suggest we might try to meet in, in gather town if you if you want any offline questions to the speakers i i encourage the speakers to come directly i'll be there in, in a moment and uh, thank you all for coming thank you for sharing My pleasure. Yeah, bye thank you <laughs> goodbye